is an interview with Jim Dinkalsi. Jim, can I begin and ask you about the early days and the things that Nibs told you about Hubbard? What did Nibs tell you about his father's research and his use of drugs? Well, there's one very interesting story that he talked of. Uh, Nibs was about 18 or 19, I think. He was with his dad. He hadn't been with his dad, so he had come to be with his dad, and that's in the early 50s uh, when they were just starting up the Dianetic Foundations. And they were experimenting on all different ways of finding out about past lives. And LRH gave his son Nibs some amphetamines, and Nibs started talking, he said. So really going, talking fast, you know, speed. And he kept talking, and he kept talking, and his dad kept giving him speed, and all of a sudden he was talking about the, his history when he was a clam and all these different situations in early Earth. And out of that came History of Man. LRH just sat there, he said, and wrote everything he said, and word for word published it as the History of Man. Great. Now, just going on down to the Sea Org, when you were, when you were in the Sea Org and you were assistant medical officer, tell me about the cholera incident and the impact that Hubbard's loss of temper at that time had on you. Well, I had just arrived at the ship, maybe a month before, and, uh, you know, this was the man who was going to change the universe was living on the ship. I had given up uh, graduate school and everything to be with. And the medical officer who before myself was sick, I just got pulled on one day because they had to have cholera injections. Saw him, gave him the shot, uh, or the, the public health people did, gave shots to everyone on the ship. And people were having reactions to him. They were pretty strong reactions. And he got sick from it. He wasn't well. And I was supposed to go get some medicine for him. So I went to the doctor. I told the doctor what the problem was. The doctor gave me some medicine laid out. Actually, I think the doctor even came to the ship. And then I was supposed to go get the medicine. Oh, that's OK. You know, he had written Dianetics. And he said sometimes, you know, I you can use medicine. Uh, but of course, pain and all of that stuff is very psychological. It doesn't, it's all in the mind. You know, we can, they could heal anything with auditing. Anything. So, I uh, went to the pharmacy and I saw that these were pain, they had ordered some painkillers too. So, obviously, the man who has total control over matter, energy, space, and time would not need painkillers. So I didn't get the painkillers. I went back to the ship, and I gave him the medicines. And he said, where are the painkillers? I didn't get them. I, I didn't think you would need them. And he started screaming. I'm sure you could hear him a mile away from the ship. And I just went hollow inside. This was not my expectation of the man who had uh, learned about the mind and everything about the mind who is this enlightened being. Screaming and yelling and cursing and saying I had I'm, laid all this stuff on me, how bad I, uh, how my intentions were probably not good. Uh, so I ran out very fast. I got him the, the painkillers. I came back and through the years we developed a a much deeper rapport, but at the time it was a, a major shock. But, but that was his normal way of screaming and yelling at people. I, I wasn't anyone special to get screamed at. That meant that I was a little closer to him, so I had more proximity, but everyone got screamed at. Why did you think that at. was? He had no real depth of self-esteem. So he saw everyone suspiciously and assumed everyone was intentionally attacking him. Governments were attacking him, and then everyone around who made a mistake, they also were attacking him. And the only thing he could do would be to attack back. 
more strongly, with more force. And actually, in the early 70s, he was pretty gentle compared to the way it was in the, his later years. Well, moving on to sort of 73, when you went, accompanied him on his flight to Queens in, in New York, tell me the story about what happened with the, when he landed with his suitcase full of money and how he felt about that. Well, it was this briefcase. <clears throat> we had gone to the ship and gotten all the cash that was there, so there were... And so he had American cash, French, uh, and Moroccan, all in this briefcase, and he thought he would just walk across. He didn't want the U.S. government or... But you could just stop me. Tell us how much he had, because that will help him. He had start, start at least $100,000 okay. cash. Just start you again. Tell me from the beginning how much he had in the currencies. Okay. So uh, we went to the ship. He came up from Morocco. We went to the, he went to the ship and they got as much cash that was available. About $100,000 worth in different currencies, including American, probably 50,000 in American. And he took this briefcase. The plan was just to go into the United States. No one would know where he was, and he couldn't get extradited because they wouldn't even know where he was, figuring he was still in Morocco or France or somewhere. This is the French case. So, uh, I was going separately, and we noticed that he got pulled by two, they look like feds or someone, the two cops or whatever, two plain clothesmen, took him off. And we waited around for about an hour for him, and he came out visibly shaken. It was, he was not even uh, there, you know, in the sense of being present. He was pretty out of it. And they had... When he showed the money, they asked him to open the briefcase, which he hadn't expected, and he had to declare $100,000 coming into the country, which means that not only did the government know, but the IRS knew, which was really horrible to him because the, uh, he was always having trouble with the IRS. Everyone, basically the federal government, knew that he was in the United States. I didn't know at the time that there were cases against him in the United States. Too. And he didn't, so he didn't really want to be, want it known that he was in the United States. So that was pretty shocking for him. And we drove around, he was just out of it. He didn't know, he was back, kind of babbling. And finally he saw Howard Johnson's, and he said, the hotel there in Manhattan, and he said, Howard Johnson's, let's go there, let's go to the motel. So that's what we did. We stayed there for a day, and the next morning, I mean, he just, kind of went to bed, and the next morning he was a little bit more lucid and we could figure out what our next steps were. And that's when we started, we moved to Queens and found places to live. Now you uh, <coughs> were with him for some time in, in, in Queens. What was he like when you were in hiding with him? And what was he like to live with? And what was he like at dinner and that sort of yeah. thing? Actually, he was very personable. Everyone has said how charismatic he is. and. He was. He'd tell great stories at the dinner table. You know, I would cook, and then I'd come, and I'd tell him my day, and he would tell his day, and then he would usually tell some past life story, you know, whatever. You know, many, many, many of them. Uh, and he was nice to be with. Like, that's kind of the, the tragedy of his life, is that he was a personable, nice guy. And he placed himself in this position of power and control that he couldn't control. And he did it by being abusive and using the old management technology of uh, fear, running everything by fear. But that's not the way I think he wanted to do it. It's the way he did it. That's the way he saw it had to be done. But that's uh, not the way he really, I think, wanted in his heart to be. Did he ever tell stories about his war experiences? What sort of things did he tell you about? Uh, he told me a lot of stories of his life, you know, and all the people in it. Most of that was on the briefing course, similar stories I had heard. Uh, you know, being the leader of a squadron of corvettes in the Atlantic, which I don't think ever happened at all, but he said that it did, and, and then he'd tell me little stories around that. 
you know that he had written this the mr was it mr roberts the movie mr roberts i think it was that that character was taken from his life stories and he had written it up and someone else stole it from him that's where people were doing a lot they were stealing things from him like the a great example of being of Excalibur was his first book that drove a couple of editors crazy and it was stolen by the Russians later to be found by uh, in a carton in his personal storage with three copies of it in never stolen but it sounded good that the Russians had stolen it. And what about his previous wives? What's the stories did he say about them? <clears throat> uh, that they never really cared for him. Now, his second wife was a Russian agent, obviously, and that's why she had liked him to be with him. And, and that she had never really, he had never married her, but then he did have to divorce her. You know, and I've, I think I saw the marriage certificate later on that. But uh, at the time, I accepted everything he said. Why would he have any reason to lie? And I wasn't, I mean, I went to school to get a degree in counseling to figure out what was going on. And that's when I found out about paranoia. And that the paranoid, who's fearful and always suspicious, also is a pathological liar. They have delusions of grandeur where they're bigger than life, like being in charge of this sector of the universe. And then there's a tremendously low self-esteem that can only be dealt with by telling lies so that you don't look bad to people. You know, and he was a great man just the way he was. He didn't have to lie about his history. His charisma could carry him through anything, but he didn't believe that. You know, he didn't realize the impact he had. He thought it was just the stories, I'm sure. Because that's all he did was tell stories. And did, did he ever mention Libs' mother, Polly? Yeah, uh, a little, but I don't remember I think he mentioned to it. me before that he said something about she wouldn't have him back after the war because he was blind and crippled. Is that, the, does that ring the bell? Mm. Don't worry. No, I can't okay. remember. And was it you, at Queen's, because you, you, he wasn't so involved in day-to-day -day organization, <coughs> which left him free to think up bright ideas, I remember you told right. me, and he, Operation Snow White was one of those. Were, were, can you talk to me about that and whether that's a sort of typical thing when he's depressed and thwarted? Well, since he had a lot of time in Queen's to be creative, which he liked to do, he would figure out different things to come up with. And, one of them was Snow White. I went to the library to get the names of all the characters and uh, figuring out how the, the Guardian's office of that time could handle some of the situations that were popping up all over the world. Uh, that was actually his creative time. He actually got healthier when we were in Queens, which was really unusual. I had him on, he was doing a lot of vitamins, he was eating well. Uh, even though he was tremendously depressed all the time, at least he was doing some writing and things that would get him out of it. So he would come up with all different projects for people to do and knew he would listen to watch TV in the middle. He'd just watch TV all the time. The idea was to see where the culture is at. Mm -hmm. That's where he came up with later with the music that he figured out and all that different stuff. Was Snow White because he felt the world was getting at him? Yeah, that was his excuse for not being the powerful person that he was trying to portray to everyone, that everyone was trying to do him in, and, and it was hard to hold up against everyone. I never saw any of the abilities that he talks about as an OT that he exemplified, especially living with him you know, in that time, at least 10, 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day. This uh, t total control over mental matter, energy, space, and time, the clear, he never exemplified that because he wasn't in control. You know, he was always depressed or upset about it. And then to be total control over matter, energy, space, and time, that's a whole other level. 
N no, not at all. No, he couldn't make things appear or disappear or even be out of his body at all. And all the time I knew him for nine years, he was never out of his body. And he told me that. He would tell me experience, experiences he had had early on where he was on a cloud, where he had felt the ice crystals and all that. But he had never had any experience while I knew him in the nine years I was with him. And then... Um Moving on now to when you get back on the ship and he's had that motorbike accident, a lot of people said that was a big turning point in his character for the, for the worse. Is, is that true? And, and what happened? To, uh, was this what, that was that the painkiller incident? Or was yeah. Uh, when we finally, he finally, they said it was safe for him to go back to the ship. Uh, he went from Queens. We went back to the ship. And in Las Palmas, he had, and someone had gotten a big, gotten him a 1500 cc Honda, big bike, and he took it riding up on the hill, got it in, a, uh, it slid out from him, and he had to lift it up, carry it, and go back to the, ride it back to the ship, and he had a couple of cracked ribs, which were very painful to him. And he didn't like pain. I learned that when I first came on the ship. <laughs> he did not like pain at all, and he took painkillers. There was no pain. That was his objective. Uh, now he has two cracked ribs. He was afraid to go to the hospital, so they had to bring kind of an x-ray machine to the ship. And they showed his ribs, which they had to bandage. And the doctor gave me painkillers, or told me to, you know, the painkillers to give him. And I gave him the two that were, that he told me to give him. And LRH had, a re, had basically what happens with the painkillers, especially muscle of relaxants, is they relax the body. Well, he wasn't used to being relaxed. He was very agitated. You know, meditation is supposed to relax. The, everything you're, uh, you do, even in the auditing of Scientology, is coming from this alert place. And yet there's a relaxed, non-attached. He was never in that state of non-attached. It was always attached and going. Triple type A, shall we say. <laughs>